התחלנו. רק אם הרוד רוצה לעשות עוד פעם את ההקדשה, איפה הרוד? בסדר גמור, אתה כבר, כן, כן, אוקיי. Okay, um, good morning to everybody. So if you, I'll review the title for today's share. I'll give a minute for everyone to come online. Uh, the title for today's share is trying to understand all the difficult stories about Yaakov. So the way I want to begin to share, so people um, get started, anyone who wants in a very short way, tell me if there's a story in this week's parsha, next week's parsha, or from now to the rest of Breshit, about Yaakov's behavior that sounds a little bit um, problematic. Just real short, like not more than 10, 15 seconds. Just tell me a story that bothers you a little bit about his behavior. Manipulating the flocks. Manipulating oh, the genetic engineering. Okay, I didn't even put that on my list, but that's a good, if we get there, maybe we'll get there. I'll call that genetic engineering. All right. Buying, buying the birthright. Oh. Buying, buying or which one? The buying the birthright or stealing the birthright? Well, well the, the, the beginning for a, for, a, for, a, for a pottage, for the soup, okay. under duress, obtaining okay. it under duress. Okay, and now I, I'll, I'll give you another 50, 20 seconds. Tell me what's so bad about what he did? Uh, depends. From a business point of view. He, he took advantage of somebody's uh, state. We don't quite know why. But it potentially took advantage of someone to rob them to, to diminish them or something, even though it says that you know, that um, uh, Esau didn't appreciate his birthright. Uh, we, but he may not appreciate it, but it still was his. Yeah. So, In other words, but what he did was a pretty rotten way to buy something. And what it was, was uh, and using using methods which we did, we do not agree with are the best. Yeah. Okay. I, I would, it wouldn't be, um, okay, I agree with you. Okay, that's for sure a problem. Okay, so everyone agrees that that's a, a major problem. Hopefully we'll discuss that today. Um, how about in the next story, when he steals the blessings? When Rifka dresses him up and steals the blessings? Is that good or bad? It's bad. <coughs> it's bad. That's not okay. Yeah. How about after that? Um, how, how about his, the, the netter he makes? If God takes care of me, this and that. Remember, he makes the ten percent deal. I, I think that he should have offered God more than ten percent. Okay. Well, maybe he was worried that um, people might learn from him. Maybe right. worried about it. Might have been a takana for for future generations. Maybe um, I was half listening to this year beforehand. Maybe he was worried what would what would happen to future generations. Maybe it's public policy. So if he would do, maybe he should have done twenty percent. But if he did twenty, then all future taxation would be twenty percent. And that would be um, that would be too hard. That would be exerted that the tzibur can hold on to. It was, it was a strange decision. Asuras read a law. Yes. The kickback of ten percent. Yeah, you should you should be getting more already. Okay. And any any later story? Any other story later that bothers you about him? Uh, that he didn't. Yeah, his response to the uh, um, to the uh, to the masa with. Uh, uh, Shimon and Levi and uh, Shem. Uh, right. I think there's some problems with how Yaakov responds to that. So if you're a right winger, he was too soft on them. If you're a left winger, he was too. He agreed. If you're a left winger, you don't like what he did because he agreed with them too much. If you're a left winger, you don't like what he did because he, I'm sorry, because if you're a right winger, he didn't support them enough, maybe. Whatever maybe. it is, every, everyone doesn't well, like what he did there for one, from one way or the other. Well, what is really problematic is that when Shimon and Levi offered him the explanation, he he's silent, or the Torah does not record yeah, what, what he said, any yeah. other response from Yaakov, which I think to, that's what it to me is that's problematic. Yeah, because it was their system. Yeah, but we'll get to that also. Okay. Yeah. And any more? Just, I'll take one more in case anything else happens. Favoritism. It's, it's favoritism of Yosef and all the oh, sort you know, Over, no, not just playing Yosef, fine. But after Yosef is gone, his over-favoritism to Benjamin, the heck with all the other sons, you know, so what, Shimon's going to you know, die in jail there and you guys are starved? No one's touching my Benjamin. Like there's, there's, how come Benjamin is, how come he rates so much more than all the other brothers? Agreed? Okay. 
So I'm going to try and answer all those today. Not sure how. I think we've got like three hours now. Um, extend, the, extend the time. <laughs> what I need to begin with, I, I guess there's another title for this year. Anyone remember the last line of the Navi Micha? You know it by heart, but you don't realize it's the last line of Micha. I'll help you out. The, the last line of Tashlich. In Tashlich, almost in a, in a, in a, uh, in an amazing way, we quote from Micha. The last three lines of Micha. Remember Miyav Kamocha and Osei Avon Velver Pesha? No, no, that's uh, that's earlier in um, that's that's in the end of Parak Vav. The end of the book is Titain Emet Liakov. Chesed. That's about Abraham. Titain Emet Liakov. I'm not sure what it's referring to, but it, it might be a wish. Is Yaakov Yaakov Avinu or Yaakov another name for Am Yisrael? Unclear. But Titain Emet Liakov. If there's a midah of our avot, Chesed with Abraham makes sense, but remembering Emet in relation to Yaakov is quite difficult because his whole life is full of trickery. If you're looking with a forefather who's like the symbol of Emet and truth, it's very hard to identify Yaakov as the example of truth, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So that's another. That's an altered time. Now we're going to get to work. Who's ever online is online. We're going to get to work. Yeah. Um, I checked the Torah Mitzvah website to make sure which year I'm given on this in the past. And sure enough, I noticed this morning that last year, I gave a share called Bechira Bechora Bracha. And, and some, some of you were there. I'm not going to give you a test on it, but I need that share as a background for today's share. So I'm not going to do that share over. I'm going to review the key points of that share because that's going to be my, my um, point of departure to, to try to explain everything in Yaakov's behavior. And just to review the key points of the share, and I'll share the screen in a minute. I defined three different words. I'm not saying that's what exactly what the words mean, but I'm going to define them for the sake of the share. We call it uh, let, um, the letter B, or letter Bet, because all of them. There's Bechira, Bechora, and Bracha. Three concepts that take us through Sefer Breshit. Bechira is the process of who's being chosen. First, it's Abraham, to exclusion of everyone else. Then it's Yitzchak to the exclusion of Ishmael and Keturah's sons. And then it's Yaakov to the exclusion of Esau. And then it's over with Yaakov. And when we get to Yaakov, everyone's chosen. I'll show a diagram of this in a minute. Then there's another concept called bracha, that a father, before he dies, gives blessings to his children based on their behavior. Towards when the father feels his, his time is up or it's coming close to his death, he wants to make sure that the family legacy continues. He gives blessings to his children. And then there's a concept of Bechora, of leadership. Of, um, Bechora technically means firstborn, but rarely does it go to whoever was born first. By default, it should go to who's born first. But Bechora is more type of a leadership of, of, um, of a nation, of, of, a, of a family. And when a father who is leading the family passes on, he wants to make sure that at least one of his children are going to lead the family to make sure the legacy continues. I want to begin with, maybe someone remembers, I want to prove first that the word Bechora is not about being born first, but it's about leadership. And that's just leadership, a very important leadership. And this will help us begin. Who remembers the first time I have the concept of Bechora in Sefer Shemot? Anyone remember? remember? In Sefer Shemot. Bani Bechori. Ah, very good. In the end of Perak Dalad, God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, when he's leaving Midian, before anything begins, he tells Moshe, I gave you all those signs, go to Pharaoh, tell him, send my people out and everything. But your opening line to Pharaoh in the end of Perak Dalad is, tell Paro, B'ni B'chori Yisrael. Now, if you remember Chumash, before Avram is born, there's 70 nations. If God has a firstborn child, that means he has more than one child. And there's lots of children. There's 70 nations, they're all God's children. But he calls the Jewish nation that's forming now in Egypt, that is my firstborn child. Now, if you look at the history of nations at that time period, if it's the uh, uh, late, late bronze, Egypt is the firstborn. Egypt is one of the most major civilizations at the time. And if, if you're asking civilization-wise, Egypt is almost like a firstborn child because they're one of the greatest civilizations and one of the earliest ones. But what God's saying is, I have a nation that's going to take leadership for nations. They have a job to do from God's point of view. And God calls his new nation his firstborn. 
Not because they're born first, but because they have the responsibility. Now, the big question is, is Bukhara privilege or responsibility? What's something, if it was, um, I couldn't do this in America, but I could do this in Israel. Let's say someone's running for president. Is he motivated because he cares about his country? He's patriotic. He, he wants to be president because he wants all the responsibility. He thinks he can do a great job and save his nation. Or is it all about himself? I'll get rich. I'll be famous. I'll be great. I can make a lot of money on it. Or in, in any public position, show president, whatever, class president, mayor of a city. When someone takes public responsibility, when someone takes leadership, is that leadership all about responsibility or is it about privilege? Now, from a monetary point of view, what privilege does the firstborn get? Just think plain old business. If you're the firstborn, from a financial point of view, what does that translate into? Just with laws of... of um, Bishnayim. Means it's complete. You get a double portion. If the father, if there's nine children and the father leaves over $1,000, then every son gets $100, the poor gets 200. That's Pishan, that's classic. So that's definitely a privilege. The question is, what's the reason for that privilege? Does the poor get a double portion because he has more responsibility? Or that's something he lucked out because he was born first? Now, what we're going to find is that Yaakov and Esav are having an argument over who should be the poor. And even when they were born, it was a close call. If you remember, we read that this morning. When they're coming out, but it's a race for who's coming out first. But when Yaakov and Esau were fighting over the Bechora, or arguing over the Bechora, or selling it, does Yaakov want the Bechora because he wants a double portion? Because he wants to be famous, he wants to be great? Or does he want to take leadership of the family? And, um, and he thinks that, you know, that goal may be so important that it might be okay to use trickery to do that. I don't want to bring examples, but let's say you're sure that the political system in a certain country is bad. And you're sure that you can offer better political leadership. And you're sure that the person running the country or might be running, it's like, would be a disaster. And you're sure you can do it better. What actions are you allowed to take to make sure that you, you take leadership? You follow? It, it's a massive question to this very day in Israel, isn't it? What's permitted and what dangers do you take? And you know, how much do you bend the law a little bit or maybe lie a little bit for a greater good? Now, let's, um, let me open up the waiting room here. Okay, now, um, I wanna begin with a, a five minute summary of the shir we did last year to understand this idea of Bechora, which will hopefully explain what's going on in the in this year. Here's my file, here we go. I'll make this real small and just, am I right that we did this year last year for those who were in this year? Remember this drawing with algebra maybe? Just tell me yes or no, otherwise I'll go slow. Do you guys remember this page? Yes. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay, someone remembers. Okay, so I I'll, I'll, won't go too fast, I won't go too slow. Here we go. What I explained as follows, let me make this bigger now. And I'll explain my drawing. It's called Using Algebra to Explain Sefer Breshit. And I don't have a, I can't draw with this, can I? No, I don't have a drawing tool, but it's okay. We'll be fine. Um, you, can, you can see my little, do you see my little mouse moving around? Yep. You see we that? See it. We see, see it. it. Okay, good. Now, what's happening? This process, this converging process, I refer to as Bihira. What's that mean? From all the nations, from all the people, God picks Avram Avinu to start a nation. Avram is chosen to start a nation. Even though God told Avram Avinu, your children are chosen, the Zarcha Atenatar Tzazot, God sort of limits that later on in chapter 17, in the story of Brit Milah, where God says, Ki bi Only Yitzchak is chosen and nobody else. Even though Yishmael was born, Yishmael will be great. He'll be a nation, but not the chosen nation. Yishmael is out. Keturah's children are out. Only Yitzchak is chosen. Even though I promised you your children, but only Yitzchak. Yitzchak gives birth to two children, Yaakov and Esav. For some reason, only Yaakov is chosen. Esav is not part of the nation. When Yaakov is chosen, what do we know? All of Yaakov's children are chosen. And from that time on, born Jewish, you're always Jewish. So there's a converging process called Bechira, 
That's Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Once it's over, then we have tribes and everyone's chosen. Each tribe will get a blessing from their father. That's the last story in Sefer Breshit in Parsha Taichi, when Yaakov blesses all the tribes. And one of those sons is going to be the leader, the Bechor. Will it be Ruvain, who was born first? Well, maybe it should have been, but he messed up, didn't he? Shimon and Levi, well, Yaakov doesn't like their behavior either, even though maybe some of us do like their behavior. Yehuda, oh, he was pretty, he proved himself with leadership. So is Yehuda going to be the leader? Or, or maybe maybe um, Yosef might be the, the Bukhor, because he was Rachel's firstborn son. Maybe he'll get a double portion, or maybe he'll lead. How come I brought that up? Because what happens in the end, one type of leadership goes to Yehuda. Remember, I'll tell you, Yehuda is going to be a leader, but also Yosef will get a double portion because Yosef becomes two tribes if I'm in Benjamin. But now, this Bechira process takes three generations, which I call N equals three. N represents the number of generations in the process. And therefore, um, what I want to show you is what's going to explain a lot of the questions in Sefer Breshit is the fact that our forefathers don't know what the final value of N is going to be. We know the Bechira process took three generations. What I was suggesting was that Avram Avinu thought that it was an event, not a process, that he was chosen. Avram assumed all of his children would be chosen. He wanted Ishmael to be part of the nation. It was his son. He even wanted Lot, his, his nephew. B'nek Turah. Who decided only, what do you call it? Only, um, only one son? That was God's decision. Now, why was that? Because Sarah is the only matriarch. There's one patriarch, one matriarch. And maybe had Sarah had more children, maybe they all would have been chosen. We'll never know because she only had one child. But it was God, the Bechira process is up to God. And if you follow your Chumash, God's name El Shaddai starts the process in chapter 17. God says, my name is El Shaddai. I'm changing your name from Avram to Abraham. And now you'll have a child. His name will be Yitzchak. And he's the only one chosen. And it ends with Yaakov. Also in, in Perak Lamed Hay, in Parshat Vayishlach, God tells Yaakov, Ani El Shaddai, you're, all your children are chosen, and I'm changing your name from Yaakov to Israel. So the two, the two times in Chumash where El Shaddai speaks and changes the name, it's when the process begins and process ends. That's the Bechira process. We did that more in detail last year. Now, why do we use that? We use that to explain. Wait, let me get the, let me open up the uh, waiting room. Okay, there we go. Admit all. Oh. One second. Admitting to the waiting room. Already. They're in. One more. Okay, we're in. Uh, back to the side. Sorry about that. Now, back to um, what did we explain last year? What I tried to explain last year is that if I want to understand what Yitzhak's doing, why is Yitzhak blessing Esav and not Yaakov? My assumption was is that Yitzhak has every reason to think that all of his children are chosen. That's what I call N equals two. God told, we read that um, We read that this morning. Remember, God says there's a famine in the land. God tells Yitzchak, don't go down to Egypt, stay in land. Remember, Remember that line? You're the only chosen one. And therefore, you're chosen and your children. Don't go, because you're chosen and you and all your children are chosen, don't go down to Egypt. You stay in Israel. I'll take care of you here. There's no reason for Yitzhak to think that only one son would be chosen. Yitzhak thinks that Yaakov and Esav are both chosen. And the only question is, who's going to lead the family? And therefore, the, the blessing that Yitzhak was planning to give Esav, which Yaakov stole or tricked him to get, was not a blessing that you're the only one, but rather you're the leader. If you remember that blessing, I'll just have it right over here real fast. That blessing was, you should be a rich man. Remember, you should be wealthy. That's a blessing. That's not you're the only one. And you should be the head of a nation that other nations will bow down to and appreciate and respect. But within the family, you're the leader. The blessing that Yitzhak was planning to give Esau was you should be the leader of the family. Your brothers will be subservient to you, but you're all in the same family. You'll be running a nation that other nations look up to, and you should be wealthy because you have a big job to do. 
And as long as I have the source sheet here, the Eben Ezra had a beautiful insight because he asked the question, how could Yitzhak make a mistake if he was a Navi? So I, I won't go through the whole Eben Ezra because he just says everyone else is wrong. And then he says, I have this over here. What's Eben Ezra say? What do I think is the right thing? What Yitzhak was telling Esav, the blessing that Yitzhak was planning to give Esav, which went to Yaakov, wasn't an actual blessing of determining anything. It was a prayer about the Jewish people. It wasn't a false prophecy. God answered his tefillah. Why? He says Yitzchak's blessing, and we're going to return to this later on, is actually a blessing not on a specific child, but on the Jewish people. We should be a people that God should bless with prosperity. We should be wealthy, but we should use our wealth for the better good, for the, for, for the good of, of all people. We should be in a leadership position among nations. Other nations, we need to become a nation that other nations are bowed down to. Now, at the time of Yitzchak, we're not a nation yet. We're barely a family. So he says, this idea of Yavduch Amin, Yishtach Amin, is not for of the person. It's a blessing for the Jewish people. But within the Jewish people, Esav should be the leader. Assuming that Esav would be the Bechor. And just to prove that, if you look in Tilim, look at, it's the last book, in, the last um, Mizmor in book two of Tilim. It's a Mizmor, it's a song by David HaMelech to his son Shlomo. For help for Shlomo, that Shlomo should be a king doing justice and righteousness. But towards the end, he says, other nations should come and serve you. From Turkey, from Tarshish, wherever that is, far away. But this great area, the kings of that area should come and bow down to you. From the islands of Greece, people should bring you presents. From Ethiopia and Sudan, they should make peace treaties with you and come and respect you. The blessing that David Melech is giving Shlomo for his kingdom is almost the exact same blessing that Yitzchak was planning to give Esau, that you should be the leader of a nation that other nations respect and bow, not bow down to out of fear, but out of respect. Why would they bow down to us? He goes on, he says, we should be a nation with prosperity, but be a model nation representing God by using our prosperity to help those in need. And we want a king who talks about God, but uses his wealth and his wisdom and his prosperity for the betterment, for the good of his people and for good of all civilization. So what, what, what Ebenezer was explaining, the Yitzchak was not really choosing one son over the other, he was simply giving a prayer for the Jewish people. If we have time, we'll return to this prayer later on. Now, let's go back to our, our uh, explanation. If we're correct, Yitzchak has no reason to think that only one is chosen. One mother, Rivka, one matriarch, twins. I can explain Yishmael was out because of his mother was Hadar. So I can explain why Yishmael was out. But there's no logical reason why Yitzchak should think that both children aren't chosen. And if I have two sons, Esav and Isadeh, he's a doer, and Yaakov, he's an Ishtam, and one has to be the leader, then of course Esav is the guy. I think I gave the analogy last year that Esav is sort of like the secular Jew and Yaakov is the Yeshiva Bachar. And let Esav do the army, run the politics, and let Yaakov sit and learn. And that's a great way to raise money for yeshiva. But we call later Yisachar and Zvulun. That might have been what Yitzhak was thinking. But um, what he tried to explain is that that's the Havamina. God wants to bring that possibility up so that we can undo it. Because to be the Jewish people, you need the Kol of Yaakov and the Adam of Esav. You need, in the same character of a nation, I can't divide those two elements into two different people, it's got to be within the same person, meaning Am Yisrael has to be a nation who we have the voice of Yaakov and the hands of Esau. If you're going to go and fight and be in politics, you also have to begin with the call of Yaakov, but that's already for a sicha, as for a drasha, we call that the Hezder Vort. Now, Rivka knows better. What's Rivka know? God told Rivka when she was having a child, remember, when she was pregnant, that that's not two brothers, that's That's two nations, and only one of them is going to be chosen, and it'll be the younger one. That's why Rivka knows better why she didn't tell Esav, I mean, why she didn't tell Yitzchak, not for today's share. That's a great Ramban. Now, if I go back to what Yitzchak was thinking, if Yitzchak was planning to give Esav the Bechorah, 
and Yitzchak was blind to Esau's bad behavior, it makes sense that he wanted to bless Esau to run the family. What's the proof that when the children are growing up, the assumption is they're both chosen? Because Yaakov and Esau are fighting over who's the firstborn, not over who's the only one. The blessing is not a blessing you and nobody else. The blessing is who's leading the family, who's the president, who's the prime minister. Yaakov, recognizing Esau's weaknesses, and Esau isn't really fit for the job, it's his goal to take the job because he thinks he should be running the family. Now, when Esau comes in from a hard day's work, remember, he's tired, he puts his um, you know, feet up and stuff like that. He said, oh, give me that bowl of soup. I don't think he's about to die. He's, he's not deathly ill. He just came for a whole day of hunting. He's just exhausted. He wants the remote control and a beer and a pizza and you know, live it up. He asks Yaakov, give me a bowl of soup. What does Yaakov do? He says, you want a bowl of soup? Okay, first give me the birthright. And Esav, as someone mentioned before, is willing to sell the birthright for a bowl of soup. That, that's the last line of the parsha. Let me just show you that pasuk real fast. Um, let me stop this share and do another share. If you remember the end of that story, which is unclear when we read it, but if you look at it carefully, where are we here? In the end of the story, we're in the end of chapter 25, remember? If Esa is willing to sell a bowl of soup, I mean, to sell his Bukhara for a bowl of soup, that shows he didn't really care much about the firstborn. It means, what, what did Esav say? I'm going to die. Not I'm going to die if I don't get that bowl of soup. I'm going to die 10, 20, 50 years from now. Who cares about the future? I only care about today. Is a, is a, is a, it's not I'm going to die in 10 minutes if I don't have the bowl of soup. It's I have no goal for the future other than my own life and that's it. And who cares about Bukhara? And therefore, you know what? I'll sell it for a bowl of soup. And Yaakov takes advantage of that attitude of Esav to take the Bukhara to lead the family. So that's, that's, that's how we try to understand the story here. The, the method Yaakov's using might be questionable, but his goal, I think, makes sense. Again, if I'm assuming that both are chosen, you know, and the brother's growing up, and the question is not who's the only one, but who's going to lead the family. Now, so because Rivka knows, because Rivka knows that it's going to go one more generation, and it's going to be Yaakov, and she knows that Yitzhak doesn't know that. That explains Rivka's behavior. Why does she get involved? She's sure that she's doing the right thing because she understands that's why God gave her that nevuah. If God told her and not her husband, she understands that it's her, no, her tough kid in life. Her destiny is to make sure that Yaakov becomes the only one. What Did she do the right thing or wrong thing? You can argue. But Rivka sure she's doing the right thing. Yaakov listens to his mother because she promises him, no, it'll be okay. No, don't worry about being cursed. It'll be fine. And remember, Yaakov is only worried not about doing something wrong, but he's worried about being caught. Remember what Yaakov tells Rivka? What happens if he you know, touches me and realizes he may curse me instead of blessing me? He's not saying, oh, maybe I'm lying. He's not saying, I shouldn't do it. He agrees on the goal, but he's just afraid that the, the tactic... No, the strategy is right. The tactic he's arguing, maybe it's a bad tactic. And Rivka's, don't worry, the tactic will work. And she was right, it did work. Now, um, so that, that's, we spent last year's share on that, on that incident and used that to explain it. Now let's get to the next story about Yaakov's nether. Let's go back to our screen again. Um, and what Yaakov is doing when he's, um, when he's running away. Because of, this, because of this pattern that Yishma was thrown out, and later Esau will see. But when Yishma was thrown out of the family, he was sent away, wasn't he? He was sent away from Israel. Yitzhak, who was chosen, couldn't leave Israel. When Yaakov sends, when, I'm sorry, when Yaakov goes away to Padan Aram to get a wife, and Yitzhak sends him away, so Yitzhak says, you know, go get a wife and come back one day, things will be great. But Yaakov might think exactly the opposite. Maybe my father and mother are just being nice to me, Maybe I'm being sent away like Ishmael was sent away. Maybe I'm unchosen. Therefore, Yaakov needs reassurance that he indeed is chosen, which takes us to the story in, um, in this week's Parsha. I mean, not this week, but next week's in, in Parsha said. But I want to end with the final lines of this week's Parsha. Let me share a different screen now. 
I want to share the screen. What happens at the end of Parshat? Um, at the, the beginning of Perich Havchet. I'm sorry, Perich Havchet. Let me open up Perich Havchet real fast. We'll need this later on. And then the Perich Havchet, I mean, the beginning of Perich Havchet, Yitzchak calls Yaakov and says, you know, go get a wife. Ben Aramp. And then he blesses him as follows. The El Shaddai Yivarechotcha. God should bless you. But El Shaddai, that's the God who chose him over Ishmael. Okay? And he should give you fruitful multiply. This is all the blessing of, of Brit Milam. And God should give you the blessing of Abraham to inherit the land of Israel as he promised Abraham. Now, here, Yitzchak is not granting Yaakov, you are the chosen one. He's praying and blessing him that God should choose him. Now, now that Yitzchak realizes it's up for grabs now, and N won't be two, N will be three. It means it's going to go one more generation. It's either Yaakov or Esav, after Rivka talked to him. Now he's blessing him that even though he's leaving, God should look over him and make sure he's the chosen one. But that's up to God to decide because God decides it's the Bechira process. And therefore, in Parshat Vayetze, what happens? Um, in Parshat Vayetze, what happens? Yaakov comes to, um, you no, know, he's on his way to Haran, he stops where he stops, has his dream, and that'll be our topic now. That's Parsha Be'etze, Be'ed Harana. So I'm going to stop this year and go now to um, the main topic today. What I want to explain now is what's Yaakov's nether? What's, what's the reason for what he's doing? And what we need to do now is real simple. Let me close up this screen here. Close participants. Okay, now, and close the chat. If anyone has questions, you can write in the chat, and I'll see it real fast. Um, right, let me stop here for a minute. I hope everything's clear till now. Any questions, I'll take them now. But now I want to get to the main topic. I want to understand why is Yaakov playing fair weather Jew? You know, God, you take care of me, I'll help you. And why, like you said, only 10%. So let's take a look at Yaakov's nether. Um, here we are, and we go to a different file now. Yaakov's nether here. But how does it begin? Yaakov leaves from Beersheba and goes to Haran. I'm going to put out a word which hopefully we'll get to later on. It's called a milam mancha. Vayivga bamakom. Do that. In fact, maybe I can just do a quick little control F and write the word makom. It should come up automatically. Maybe not. Okay, find the next one. Here we go. Vayivga bamakom. 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 See the word makom? It's like highlighted. It's all, it's um, over sort of overemphasized in the section. Now, then he has a dream. He has a dream that that's the background. Then Yaakov has a dream. What's in his dream? He sees a ladder. You know, everyone's a ladder with angels going up and down, and Hashem stands upon him, Nitzavalav, and tells him, "Let's listen. This is the very first time that God speaks to Yaakov, and this is a blessing of reassurance. This is what God tells him." That's God identifies himself, which means that Yitzchak had taught um, Yaakov about their heritage. He knows this idea of being chosen. And the first thing God tells him, even though you're leaving the land, the land that you're now lying on and about to leave is going to be yours one day. That's the, that's the blessing of Bechira, isn't it? That's a blessing. God told Avram the same thing in, in when he arrived in Shechem, remember? He says, uh, this is a land, remember you arrived in Shechem? He says, your children will get this land. In Bripen of Tarim, God says, no, I'm giving this land, this is the land I'm giving you. Now, look in Pasuk Yedaladel. Your children will be like the dust of the earth. And you should spread out in all four directions. And you should bring a blessing to all you know, through you, all the nations will be blessed. Now, this line, Pasuk Yedalad, let's go back. Pasuk Yedgimel is something old, agreed? I've got to say that many times. Is Pasuk Yedalad something old? This phrase, Afar Aretz, that phrase, is that something old or something new? I'll take answers if you want. Is that a new blessing or an old blessing that God had given before? Given to Abraham. Where was it given to Abraham? Uh, when he was leaving uh, 
He's a Malavita. When, when did God tell Avram his seed will be like Afar Haaretz? Between uh, Atari. No, I, 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 was, I was hoping you, that's the right wrong answer. In Brit Ben of Tarim, God tells Avram Avinu, your children will be like Kochvei HaShamayim. Oh. Like the stars in heaven, not like the dust of the earth. It's two different analogies. And he doesn't mention anything in Brit Ben of Tarim about all four directions, does he? But there is an earlier case where God told something very similar to Avram Avinu. Yeah. Anyone know where? Kochvei When he first enters the land, Bethel. Say that again? When he enters the land, he does a, he does a, um, a korban and mispeach at Bedel. But he doesn't say Afar Haaretz there, does he? Uh, okay. 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 He says, no, he says, Kechol Hayam, that's, that's after the Akedah. In the Akedah, ah. Kochvei Hashemayim and Kol Hayam Yedzen. Afar Haaretz is not at the Akedah, and Afar Haaretz is not in Brit Ben of Tarim or in Brit Mila. When he leaves Egypt. Uh, close, but not exactly. Oh, okay. it's after Lot leaves. I'll, I'll share. Let me share. I'll, I'll make an easier screen for here. Let's take a look. The first thing God tells Avram Avinu in Lech Lecha, we'll just start with Lech Lecha. Remember, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. And then, I'll bless you. I'll bless you. That's an old one, isn't it? That's the opening blessing. Through you, I'll bring blessing to the nations. That's the idea of universalism that you're chosen for a purpose for the sake of other nations to be God's model nation. Avram arrives in Shechem. And God tells him, And Avram builds a Mizbeach, doesn't he? Saying thank you. Then from Shechem, he travels to Bethel, doesn't he? And in Bethel, he builds a Mizbeach and calls out in God's name. That's the highlight of his Aliyah, making a name for God. I think we explained before, that's not talking to God, but talking about God. Calling out in God's name, Ramban, Sforno explained beautifully, that Avram begins his mission, that's the paradigm that's the model for the future of Judaism. Avram is a respected businessman, well-known, that's chesed, entertains people, talks about God, and sanctifies God by his behavior, the way he talks, the way he acts, and what he does. And his Mizbech and Beitel is a center place for giving, spreading this concept of ethical monotheism. Then he continues his travels. There's a famine. He goes down to Egypt. What happens in Egypt? Stays in Egypt. When he comes back from Egypt, what happens? Where does he go back to? Surprise, surprise. He comes up, remember, with Lot and his family. And he continues back to where? Back to Bethel, where he was in the beginning. Back to his Mizbech. See the word Makom? El Makom HaMizbech. Remember? Look, Ve'elech Masab Minegev Ad Bethel. Ad HaMakom Asher HaYisham Ola Betchila, between Bethel and the Ay. El Makom HaMizbech. And what's he do there? Ve'ekra Sham Avram B'Shem Hashem. This Makom in Bethel, both the word makom and betel, and calling out in God's name and making a name for God, that's what Avram did when he cut when he before he went down to Egypt and when he comes back from Egypt. And, and that's the highlight of his of his career. Now, let's go back to wait. Um, then we have the whole incident with Lot. Lot decides to leave. Listen carefully what happens after Lot leaves. And God tells Avram after Lot leaves him. Lift up your eyes from this place in all four directions. See all four directions? Why? That's the old blessing. You get this land, your children. God repeats the blessing of the previous chapter before he went down to Egypt. Now we're back in Beitel. A very similar blessing. There, Avram continued south. Now God says, continue on your pilot trip. Go see the land. But in Beitel, at the place of his Mizbech, he's still in Beitel. He gets this blessing after Lot leaves that your zero will be like Afar Aretz and you're going to spread out in all four directions. Now, just to highlight the parallel, I'm sorry. Let's go back to my screen here. If we go back to, I'll just show you here real fast, make this a little smaller. I want to just review what we did. Perikid Gimel. This was Avram after Lot left and Perikid Gimel. And this is what we just read. Just match up. Haaretz HaShat HaShuchei V'Leo. The God told him, he's opening the land, is yours. That's the same thing as, oh, okay, it doesn't match up here. 
There's no, how do I make a line? I don't have a line to make a pen here. Uh, maybe that, no, that doesn't work, Never mind. Okay, you can just, I'll just use my, 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 uh, my mouse, okay? The arets matches, orange matches orange, agreed? Then, kafara arets, afar arets. Four directions, Yama became much fun of the Negva, all four directions. Got it? Medivra Chuvacha, we had from earlier. All that proves is simply that God is repeating the blessing, but what blessing? The blessing of Bethel. That's what's important. The blessing we have here is the blessing of Bethel, and that's a repeat. Now let's go back now to where we were before. Um, I'm sorry. Let's go back to Yaakov's dream. What God said up until now is something old. And it's highlighting the blessing of Beit El, where Avram built the Mizbech and called out in God's name. And again, the connection to the word Makom. I'm about to highlight again Makom and Makom, just to make sure you remember that. Pasik Tedvav is something new. We never had this before. And you'll explain why in a minute. God says, I'll be with you. I'm going to guard you everywhere you go. I'll bring you back here. And I won't abandon you until I've done what I promised. This is special to Yaakov because this is the first time the patriarch is leaving the land of Israel, even though he's chosen. And God's saying, even though you're leaving, I'm still with you. In fact, the Shekhinah now, according to Chazal, goes with Yaakov and leaves Yitzhak. God is now with Yaakov for 20 years when he's by Lavan. And that's why Chazal see this as a model in Masev Asim Labanim. Yaakov is a model of Amisro in exile, that even though we've left the land of Israel, God's with us even in our exile but promises to watch over us and one day bring us back. So therefore, this is a blessing of reassurance, just like Avram needed a blessing of reassurance after Lot left him. Don't worry, you'll still have a legacy and you'll still be a nation even though your nephew left you. Here also, you're still chosen even though you're leaving the land. Now, that's the end of the Hidgalut. The revelation is over. What's Yaakov's reaction? What does he do? First, he wakes up in the middle of his dream by Katako Mishnato. He says, Achen yesh Hashem b'makom hazeh. See the word again? Bonichi lo yadati. He says, wow. He had no idea where he was sleeping was a place of, of God's presence. So first he's amazed. Okay? And first he, he's, his, his reaction is, oh my gosh, this is the place of God. Vayirav yomar, ma nora ha-makom hazeh. There we go again. Then he makes a statement. Ein zeh ki beit Elohim b'zeh shar shamayim. This is nothing else than the house of God and the gate of heaven. What's he talking about? Right? In his dream, he saw angels going up and down. That's Shara Shemaim. But in his dream, he did not see a house for God, did he? There's no house for God that he saw in this dream. He just saw angels going up and down. I'm going to leave that right now as a question, but keep that in mind. This statement that he says, this is nothing other than the house of God, somehow... For some reason, Yaakov seems to be saying in, after his dream and because of his dream that this is the site of a Beit HaMikdash, of a house for God. But there's nothing in his dream that showed him a house for God. It makes sense that he said this is the gate of heaven because I see angels going up and down. So maybe it's, an, it's a connection between heaven and earth, but what makes it a house for God? Keep that question in mind. Now, what does he do next? I mean, it was probably the middle of the night. He goes back to sleep because he gets up later in the morning. Before he leaves, he's going to do something. And we're going to see Pasuk Yudchet Nyotet or preparation for his, for his resolution. He gets up in the morning. Uh, this Evan that he, was, that he was sleeping by, he puts oil on it. I'm sorry, he puts oil on it to sort of consecrate it to... Okay? And he turns it into a monument. A matzeva is not an altar. It's a monument. It's a marker. He wants to remember this spot because he wants to return to the spot and to make sure he knows where he's going to go back to. He puts oil. Hopefully the oil will remain there. He'll see it. But he's consecrating this site and he's putting up the Evan to be a monument to remember where to come back to. What does he do next? Even though the name of the city was loose. Yaakov is not in charge from Israel Pnim of giving names to cities, is he? When Yaakov calls this Makom, see the word Makom again? This Makom he calls Beit El. 
He's not saying this is the name of the city. In my opinion, he's stating his resolve that this place one day will become a house for God. But it's not a prediction. I want to say it's going to be part of his resolution. I'll prove it in a minute. When Yaakov calls this place Beit El, he's saying, this is going to be a place where I want to build a house for God one day. Didn't, let me stop the screen for a minute. Didn't we see the name Beit El already in Parshat Lech Lecha? How could Yaakov call it Beit El if Avram was already in Beit El? Does everyone understand my question? In Perik, in Perik Yud Bet and Yud Gimel, Avram goes to Beit El, doesn't he? But Yaakov only calls it Beit El some 50 years later, 100 years, who knows how many years later. Decades later, Avram, why does Yaakov call it Beit El now? So I'll share with you a little secret. Avram does not call it Beit El. Chumash tells us that where Avram built his Mizbech was Beit El. You paying attention to that? Avram doesn't call the place Beit El. It's, it's the place of Avram's Mizbech where he calls out in God's name. The omniscient narrator of Chumash, who we refer to as God, was, or Chumash, is telling us that where Avram built his Mizbech and the highlight of his original Aliyah and the highlight of his return and the center of his mission, of his life in the land of Israel, that was Beit El, because that's where he built the Mizbech and called out in God's name. And it's called their Makom, and it's called here. And therefore, what's Rashi tell us? I'm pretty sure it's Rashi, but for sure Chazal say, that when Yaakov wakes in the morning, oh my gosh, I was sleeping in the same place where my Zaydi was. He says, you can't believe I was sleeping. This was where Avram Avinu was. How does he know? Because he read, <laughs> now he understands Chumash. This was Avram, where Avram Vinu centered his life. Now, he's going to call Beit El. Chumash calls it Beit El because Yaakov called it Beit El. But because Chumash knows everything and was giving to us at Harsinai, so in, in Parshat Lech Lecha, Chumash calls the place Beit El to tell us that's where Yaakov is going to, the same place where Avram was, is where, Avram, where Yaakov had his dream, or at least it's the same thing behind the two sides. Now, whenever God called, talked to Avram Avinu, and promised him the land, Avram built the Mizbeach and called out in God's name. The same thing with Yitzhak. I can prove it, but you'll take my word for it. How about Yaakov? What should Yaakov do now? God just spoke to him, promised him the land. Why doesn't Yaakov do the same thing that Avram did? Or later Yitzhak? Why doesn't he build a Mizbeach and call it in God's name? Wouldn't you expect Yaakov to do that? He, he knows it's the God of Avram and Yitzchak. He knows that Avram and Yitzchak called out in God's name. He knows their tradition. Why doesn't he do the same thing his forefathers did? Anyone want to suggest an answer? Well, Yaakov, I mean, Yaakov is in the midst of a flight from potential danger. So he's, his mission isn't like Abraham's was to now convert the masses and to project the mission uh, that he's been given. Yaakov is literally fleeing for his life. So it's like, it's not the time in Yaakov's life where he's going to take on this mission. Exactly. His life, he's a fugitive. He's running for his life. And we'll see a minute, he's penniless, isn't he? How do we know he's penniless? Remember when Lavan, he doesn't, when he goes to Lavan, he doesn't have a penny, does he? And if you read carefully, when he gets to Lavan, he's more interested in a job than he is in a wife, isn't he? When he sees Rachel, he's excited because of Rachel, not just because Rachel's pretty, but because Rachel's watching the sheep. What's that mean? I can do a better job than she can. Remember? When it says when Yaakov sees the tzon, the sheep, and Rachel, then he gets excited and moves the rock because he wants to prove I'm, I'm a better shepherd than she is. And he gets himself a job. Is that what happens? And he works for a whole month, a couple of weeks first for free, doesn't he? Then later he makes a deal about Rachel. Of course he liked Rachel, but he also wants a job. I'll prove to you that, that he cares about, he's, he doesn't know how he's going to get through the next day. But Yaakov's life, he's nowhere anywhere close to what Avram was. Avram could make a name for God because he was established. He had a family. He had wealth. He could. Hello. In Yaakov's position, he has no audience. There's nothing for him to do there. But even though he would love to do what Avram was doing, he can't. So guess what he's going to do now? He's going to make a resolution. Right? He's going to make a resolution that what? I wish I could do it now, but, but 
I can't do it now, but hopefully I will later on. And then I'm going to use that to explain this nether. Let's read the nether, and then we'll get back to try to understand what he's saying, whether it's good or bad. What's his resolution? If God will be with me, and keep me and watch me wherever I go, and give me lechem lechol beke lobosh. Why am I making a big deal about that line? What's that prove? What's he thinking about? He's not saying, if God will be good to me and give me, you know, a, a vacation in the Bahamas, or if God will be good to me and give me a new car. What he's worried about, what he's praying for, is the basics of life. Lechem lechol beke lobosh. He has nothing. And then if I come back to my father's household. So these are all ifs, aren't they? The Pasach for sure is ifs. If God will be with me and take care of me and give me feet. Now, is Chaf Aleph an if or then? Is he saying, if God is good to me, then I'll, then I'll make Aliyah? No, if, if God takes care of me and makes me rich and gives me what to eat, then I'll make Aliyah? Or is he saying, if God is good to me and brings me back to Israel, then he'll be my God. We'll, we'll figure this out in a minute. Okay? But however you read Pasach Chaf Aleph, which is up, up for interpretation, let's look at his, at his promise. What's he promised to do? Yaakov is not making a prediction as a prophet. Oh, one day, 500 years from now, there'll be a house of God here. What's he saying? When I come back, I want to make a house for God. And now in light of this, we can explain everything. Because look, look how the preparation, what's he, what did he do? In his preparation, what did he do? When he got up in the morning, remember he took the oven, he made it a matseva, he put oil on the, on, the, on, the, on the matseva, and he called the place Beit El. What's that mean? I want to build a house for God here. Therefore, he says, when I get back, what am I going to do? This site, where I put up this monument to remember the site, and where I put oil to remember which rock, right? I'm going to build her a house for God. But as everyone knows, you guys probably work for shuls. You can't run a shul without a budget. And, there is a, and if God blesses me with wealth, I'm going to give 10% to support the shul. Maybe another 10% for stuck up, but 10% for the building fund or 10% for the operating fund of the Mikdash. Maybe you'll give another 10% for other, I'll answer Phil's question. He's not saying only 10% for all my, for everything. He's saying 10% for... Um, for the needs of the Mikdash. And we'll see, Ramban says, he says, I'll also be the rabbi. Ramban says, I'll be the rabbi. I build him a shul or a house for God and I'll give and I'll support it. He's going to do all three, the three things every shul needs. It's a rabbi, a building, and a budget. Now, about Pasach of Aleph, it's real easy to figure out. Why? Because it's it's so obvious that Yaakov's neder is based on God's promise. What did God say? I'll be with you. What's God say? If he'll be with me. If he'll take care of me. The, the first two match perfectly, don't they? The perfect matches. This one and that one. Perfect match. Now, what did God say? I'll bring you back to this land. Got that? Which matches. Now, that proves that this is still the if. Because everything in the if is based on what God promised. Remember, I'll be with you. I'll take care of you. I'll bring you back to this land. And God says, if indeed you take care of me and watch me and bring me back to the land, the only one that doesn't match is kilo ezavcha. I won't abandon you until I've done what I promised. But that has to match the family lechem the hope that um, Rashi brings this down. That kilo ezavcha matches the family lechem the hope that bosh. Because someone abandoned in Yahoo's position is someone without food. Now, Rashi brings, you know what proof Rashi brings to that? It's a beautiful proof he brings. He brings a proof from, from, um, from Naraiti Vigam Sekanti, a Pasuk in Tilim. Vulo Raiti, Tzadik Nezav, Bezarum of I'll show you with you the Rashi. I think I have it here. Um, let me open up my toy. Rashi on Breshit. We need Here we are. No, perfect. What's Rashi say in the in in um where's his nether? Where's the nether? Here we go. Um here we are. Okay, but here's this. See this? 
We're right over here. Rashi on Pasachav. Im yishmor li haftachot elu, should be haftachot, halalu, shiftechani hadamala. If God keeps the promises he told me above, ve'eluhein, liyoti madi, k'mo shem ar b'inen chimach, he matches up like we did. Ushmarani yishmarticha. V'natan li lechem l'cho, k'mo shamar, lo ki lo azavcha, v'amavkesh lechem hu nezav, shenemar, v'lo reiti tzadik nezav, v'zaram avakesh lachem. This is a beautiful Rashi, and we matches them all up. And v'shavti b'shalom, like he said, v'ashi v'oticha l'adama. But what we just did on our little thing is exactly the way Rashi matches them up. And this is by Yashan Lila Olam. What's Rashi saying? That all my children will be cho- will chosen. Remember our drawing? Unlike all the other people were chosen, who only one of their children were chosen, Yaakov is saying, if I'm indeed chosen and all my children will be chosen, that means the Bechira process is over. And then it will be time to return and build the house for God. So let me, how are we doing time-wise? I get another, I have another 15 minutes, okay. So, if I go back to the letter, what I want to explain now, and I'll understand the way we divided things up, Yaakov is not being a fair weather Jew and saying, you know, if God takes care of me, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of him. But rather he's saying, because right now I can't fulfill that, but as soon as I can, I will. But he's showing his resolve, his resolution. And that's why this is always great for the time of year of Hanukkah. Because when you're in a position where you have a long-term goal to make a house for God, it's, he, he wants to be even more than Avram Avinu. If the Bechira process is over, I can settle down with the family, not just the Mizbeach, a temporary place and calling out in God's name and on the move. I can build a permanent place for God. Um, a makom kavua. A, remember later in Devarim, a makom is the name of the Mikdash, the Shekin Shemosham, to make his name known. Yaakov is hoping that he'll come back and the Jewish nation will begin and he'll fulfill the goal of Avram Avinu. Now, to explain his letter, I want to make up a little story because you guys know shul rabbis. Okay? A shul rabbi is visiting two congregants in a hospital, both deathly ill, you know, in critical condition. One is very wealthy, wealthy businessman. The other is, you know, not, not just a regular old balabas. So the Balabas tells Rabbi, Rabbi, pray for me. If I get better, I promise I come to Minyan every day and I'll help you in shul and I'll fold the chairs and I'll turn off the lights. I'll do everything you need. I'll help you make the Minyan every day. I'll be there kavua. Just make sure I'm healthy. The rich man says, Rabbi, if I get better, I'm giving $50,000 to the shul. Sure enough, six months later, they both um, recover. And the Balabas every day is in shul and kept his promise, just like he said he would. Right. The wealthy man Never gave a penny. Comes Ev Rosh Hashanah, comes to Shul. Rabbi says, you know, good to see you're healthy. He says, yeah, I'm glad to be back, Rabbi. Rabbi says, don't you remember, Rabbi, when um, you were deathly ill? Rabbi says, don't you remember that you made a, a, a pledge that if you recovered, you give $50,000 to the Shul? He says, Rabbi, if that's true, I must have been really, really sick. I hope you understand. I hope you got the joke. Now, the... Uh, What's behind the joke? What I'm getting at? Those two vows are totally different. The Balabas's vow is what? If God makes me healthy, if God answers the prayer and gets me back to shul, I'll come to Binyan every day. Now, he's saying that because right now he can't, but as soon as I can, I will. The wealthy man, he's in critical condition. He could write the check right on the spot or he can do the bank transfer. Got it? What's he saying? Only if God helps me, I'll help him. I want to clarify that. That's the most important point I'm trying to make. And that goes back to my question. Is Yaakov doing something tricky again? Oh, if God helps me, I'll help him. Otherwise, forget him. He's not saying that. He's not saying, if God helps me, only then I'll help him. He's not, he's not like the rich man saying, if God makes me healthy, I'll give him $50,000. I can give it now. He's saying, I wish I, could, I wish I could do it right now, but I can't because of my predicament. If God helps me with my predicament, then as soon as that's able, I'll be able to do it for him. And he can almost understand the aim is not if, but rather when. He's not doubting God. He might be doubting himself. But Yaakov is not doubting God's promise. When he says him, he's not saying, oh, maybe he won't, maybe he will. Im could be when he happens, or he might say, like he says later, Katonti, if indeed I'm worthy of God's help, and that happens, then as soon as I come back, I'll do that. Now, why do most people not pay attention to this? For a very simple reason. Because later in Yaakov's life, what happens? He never fulfills the letter, does he? Yaakov doesn't build a house for God, does he? 
And that's why it seems like he's talking about a prediction. Because only, only David HaMelech is going to start fulfilling that nether. That's why Varech David. That's David HaMelech when he's passing over to Shlomo all the materials to build the Beit HaMikdash. David gets everything ready to build the Mikdash. And the, the concept of building a house for God is begins with David HaMelech, who in essence is Yaakov and Esav in the same character, isn't he? David has the hands of Esav and the call of Yaakov. But that's a, that's a Shiran David HaMelech. Now, why doesn't Yaakov fulfill his nether? Here's another question. You know, Yaakov made a nether, why doesn't he fulfill it? Well, when he comes back to Beit El, it's almost tragic. Why? Because he returns first to Shechem like Avram did. But what happened in Shechem, as Harold mentioned before, remember the incident in Shechem where they massacred the whole city? You could say good thing, right thing, depending on your political alignment or whatever you want to say. You don't want to get into the argument. Uh, but whether they did the right thing or the wrong thing, after that event, what does Yaakov say? You made, remember, achartemoti? You made me look really bad in the eyes of the people of the land. I look really bad now. They're going to come and kill me. You, what you did, you did something crazy dangerous. You're endangering the entire family and our future with your, right, with, with your vigilance. So, of course you cared about your sister, but I cared about the future of the Jewish people. What are you doing that? Was what, Yaakov was really angry for the massacring the whole city. He doesn't mind them saving Dina, but did, you could save Dina and go home. Why loot the whole city and kill everybody? Yaakov was angry because the, they overdid it. They say, what do you mean? We're going to teach them a lesson. Right? People in this country need to know that you don't mess with us. It was what's called a disproportionate, you know, what they call when you, a tkuva, lo, um, a disproportionate reaction to teach them a lesson. Now, whether they did the right thing or the wrong thing, Yaakov now is in no position to build a house for God because no one respects them. Even David wanted to build a house for God. God said, wait a generation because you need a time of peace. Remember, remember God told David, you're a man of war. You're living in a time of war. You can't build a house for God and make my name great when people still hate you. Wait one more generation. You have a son. His name will be Shlomo because he'll be living in a time of peace. Remember, there's a time for war and a time for peace in Kohelet, which is associated with Shlomo. You only build a house for God when people respect you, when they look up to you. And unfortunately for Yaakov, he had hoped to build a house for God, but he can't because the situation doesn't allow it. Instead, he runs away to Bethel as a city of refuge. God tells Yaakov, you, you know what? You want me to save you from the people of Shechem and the, and the neighbors of, of that area? Run away to Bethel. That's the beginning of Paraklam of Hay. If I share my screen, I'll go to Sefer. We're over here. Just go right to. We'll go right to Parakei. What happened? Numbers. Oh, here we are. We want to go to Paraklamet Hey. Actually, we'll look at Lamed, the end of Lamed Vav first. What happens there? Um, and Yaakov tells Shimon and Levi, Achartem oti lavisheni biyashvei haaretz. Might be in my house, might be his household, or maybe even the house he hoped to build for God. And they say back, you know, they get the last word in. We're not going to let them treat our sister that way. Again, without going right or wrong, right, right afterwards, what happens? God tells Yaakov, go back to Bethel and build him his back to who? To the God who appeared to you when you ran away from Esau. God gets, he gets them ready. And Yaakov tells them, we're going to go to Beit El and we'll build a Mizbech to the God who answered me in my times of trouble. Okay. And what does he do there? He builds a Mizbech, okay? Because that's where God appeared to him when he was running away from his brother. Because what's said about this is that Beit El, instead of being a house of spreading God's name and making name for God, becomes a house of refuge where God comes and saves us. It's what's called, Yaakov is in survival mode instead of revival mode. Avram Avinu was Amisel in revival mode. Yaakov is Amisel in survival mode. So you need a house for God, a Beit, a Beit El, but only a Beit El in the limited sense that it's where God protects us and takes care of us from enemies who hate us. But hopefully a Beit Elohim, a house for God, like the David's going to want to build and Shlomo's actually going to build, is when people respect us and look up to us and then we can make a name for God. And then later, um, or earlier, without going to the topic, 
God appears to Yaakov with the name El Shaddai. He changes his name. Remember, God tells Yaakov, I need El Shaddai, Peri and the land I'm going to give you. But he returns to Bethel, but because he can't build the Mikdash, when Yaakov returns to Bethel and he changes his name from Yaakov to Israel, then what happens? After um, God appears to him and reaffirms that he's chosen, Yaakov puts up a Matseva again, again puts oil on it, and again calls the place Bethel. Basically, what does he do? He reaffirms his commitment. He can't build a house for God, but he's hoping maybe, maybe in 10, 20 years, things will quiet down, and maybe then he can build a house for God. He doesn't want to forget the spot. He hopes to return. Within four or five years, 10 years, they sell Yosef. The family falls apart. Then there's the famine and everything. And unfortunately, Yaakov's life is a disaster, isn't it? What's my proof? When Yaakov came before Pharaoh, he looked like an old man, right? What did Pharaoh ask him? Jacob, how old are you? What did Yaakov say? He, did, he gave a Jewish answer, right? He says, I'm 130 and my life's been what? I've had a miserable life. Remember? I've had a miserable life. And you can't bring a better proof about Yaakov's life from that. It's sad. It's such a, such a tragedy, his life. But he always meant well. He always meant well. He had his goals were great. But the situation was in. It's so typical of Jewish history. You have great goals. But the reality of the situation you're in, irregardless who's to blame for it, but keeping in, your goals in sight, even though you can't fulfill them, That'll be related later to Hannah. Now, in the last four or five minutes, that was the main thing I tried to show you now. I'm trying to use this idea to explain all the stories about Yaakov. Now, the last thing I'll talk about is why he's favoring, why he's favoring uh, Yosef and Benjamin. So I want to share an idea which requires a whole share, but I'll just try to explain it. It's called who knows three, who knows four, or basically why it should be one matriarch per patriarch. It's, it's only logical to assume that there's three patriarchs, okay. So I could say, my, why three? But there are three patriarchs. But look at Marista Machpelah. Every patriarch should have one matriarch. Avram had one matriarch, Sarah, even though he had other wives. Yitzchak, one matriarch, Rivka. Now, I'm assuming that everyone's assuming that Yaakov can only have one matriarch. But it's up for grabs, isn't it? If you would ask Yaakov, who's the matriarch, what would he say? Well, why? I'll quote Yehuda. Atem yedatem, kishnaim yadali ishti. Remember Yehuda in front of Yosef, begging for mercy for Binyamin, saying, I'll be, he said, he's trying to say, my father will be so upset if I don't bring Binyamin back. Remember what he say? Atem yedatem, kishnaim yadali ishti, vaitzech miti v'amar toraf toraf, u'kratem gam et zebi, v'kraya son, v'aratem et stevati, shola. That was Phil's question, wasn't it? Why such favoritism to Rachel's kids? For a very simple reason. Yaakov is sure that Rachel was a matriarch because that was his wife. Everything else was a trick. Nothing tricked him. Okay, he takes responsibility. He'll support them. He'll put them to college. Like he, but Rachel is the matriarch. He's sure of that. And therefore, he has two chosen children. Who are they? Yosef and Benjamin. Now, should something happen to Yosef? Boy, that would be, that would be terrible for him. He couldn't get over it, right? But let's say something did happen to Yosef. What would be his last straw of hope? Binyamin. If something would happen to Binyamin, you follow? I'm trying to explain Yaakov's behavior. Now, just like Avram gave presents to Keturah's children and Yishmael, and Yishmael, et cetera, and Hagar's kids, and Yaakov and Esau, Yitzchak and Esau still got along, he came back for the... He's not the chosen son. And therefore, Yaakov is sure that, that his one, the matriarch, because, assuming there can only be one, the matriarch is Rachel, and the two chosen children are Yosef. That's why he makes him a colored coat. And Benjamin is the backup now. He's the other chosen son, because Rachel is a matriarch. I, she died, Rachmanis, you follow? But it, it, he's devastated by that, isn't he? But she's a matriarch. What can you do? What do Leah's kids think? Leah's kids are also sure there's only one matriarch. But they look at the news and they look at the events. Isn't it crystal clear that God wants Leah? Never ask any time. Isn't it clear that God wants us back in our land? Look at World War I or look at the Balfour Declaration or look at the Six-Day War and look at... Like, God's saying we're supposed to be back here, isn't it? How could you think otherwise? That's not a Maishas Sultan. That's Ritzon Hashem. Well, how did Lavan get away with that trick? 
That's got to be God. How did Lavan sneak um, Leah in there? How come Leah's got kids like that and one after the next and Rachel can't have children? You follow? God is screaming, Leah is chosen. He has Rachmanas on Rachel, maybe gives her a kid, but of clear Leah is chosen. Doesn't she make the Marta Machmela? It's not Rachel. It's, it's, it's a really touchy issue with them. Now, Leah's kids are so sure they're the only ones, got it? Because they're sure that's what Son Hashem, that's what God wants, because they're the only one made to her. Now, if, if Yosef and Binyamin play with Bill and Zilp, by the way, Bill and Zilpah's kids, no one even considered, right? The half bloods, no one ever dreamt that Bill and Zilpah's kids would be chosen. They're no different than Hagar's kids. Hagar's or, or Ktora, they're, they're, they're maidservants. They're, they're not, they're half bloods. There's no way they could be chosen. The children grow up thinking it's either Rachel's kids or Leah's kids. Who's Yosef playing with? With, with Bnei Bilhah, Bnei Zilpah. And the chosen sons are Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda. Don't they take all the action, don't they? Reuven takes leadership, Shimon. Now, imagine after Rachel died, who should be in Yaakov's tent? Leah should come. If Yaakov would take Bila, who would be really offended? Wouldn't Leah's kids be really offended if, if Yaakov dumped their mother, the chosen mother, and took Bila? What did Reuven do to stop that? That's why he stopped. You understand why he did it? That was a protest. So Yaakov, in order that Yaakov couldn't be with, with Bila because someone else stepped with her. But he wasn't doing it out of lust. He did it out of protest because for the sake of his mother. I'm trying to show you that explains their behavior. Now, if Yosef would leave, leave everyone alone, okay. But he starts dreaming about what? I'm the only one? They're all bowing down to me? That, he doesn't get the message from God that you're not chosen? God doesn't want B'nai Rachel? So if he kept quiet, fine. But with the, all these dreams about being great, we got to get rid of He's a danger to Klai, so isn't he? And they want to get rid of him. So they, they, they're sure they're doing the right thing when they get rid of Yosef. Remember this Bala Chalamot. What's he dreaming? It can't be his dream. It's a dream. He's just, you know, he's just, it, and his father's fault. Now, I, they know their father thinks otherwise. Has the father ever been wrong in the process? Avram was wrong about Yishmael. Yitzhak was wrong about Esau. Yaakov was wrong about Yosef. You follow? There's a pattern going on. And B'nai Le'ah are sure that they're chosen. Got it? And I'm, now, I'm just using it to explain Yaakov's behavior and, and the brother's behavior because they, they have this different understanding of the Bechira process. What I want to end this year with which I think is a really important message for today. What was Yosef's dream? Okay. The brothers are growing up fighting over who's the only one, right? Assuming only one matriarch and only either their kids or those kids. And they're fighting over, you know, you know who counts and who doesn't count. You know, who's Derek is the right way. God gives Yosef a dream. And everyone thinks that Yosef is dreaming N equals four, let me go back to my screen. Let me go back to the screen here. Yosef is dreaming. The people think he's dreaming N equals four, if you understand my drawing. No, now that he's, he's no, and, but that's only a dream, that can't be. A, another generation of this, no way. So they want to get rid of Yosef. But let me go over here for a second. What is, what is Yaakov thinking? Yaakov's thinking I call N equals three R. You understand the drawing? Three, three Rachel. Avram Bisak. Yaakov and Rachel, and two tribes, Yosef and Benjamin, and Bnei Leir out, and Meshpachot. Leah's kids are sure that what? That what? That Leah is the matriarch, and there's six tribes. Now, who would be the Bechor, Ruvain? Well, he should be the Bechor, but he lost it, remember, with Bila. Shimon and Levi, they lost it because of Shechem. Yudah, he, he proves himself. That's why he's the Bechor. But Rachel and the Bnei Shvat, they're out. And that's how Le that's you know, that's how Leah is growing up, Leah's kids, and that's how that's how what Yaakov thinks about Rachel. There's a machok between Leah's kids and their father. In the midst of all this, God's giving Yosef a dream, and what's he telling him in the dream? There's two parts of the dream. Let me go back to one other sheet for it. That's the end of the day. His dream. He was dreaming not bechira. He's dreaming bechora. And what was God trying to tell him? Remember the opening blessing that God. That's, we're a generation after Yitzchak, but what, what was Yitzchak thinking? You should be wealthy, right? And you should be a leader of nations, but your brothers are bowed down to you. 
This is Yosef's first dream about collecting wheat in the field, isn't it? Rob de Gambati Rosh. Yosef's first dream about wealth and prosperity is gathering the sheaves in the field. The second dream, who's bowing down to Yosef? The sun, the moon, and 11 stars. Remember who knows 11? Achasa Kochaya. Now, no one understood the dream. Who finally figured out the dream? Yosef, after graduating divination school. Why? Because first he solved other people's dreams, the butler and the baker, and then Pharaoh's dreams. Now he can figure out, when the brothers come down, he remembers his own dream. What was he dreaming? Realize? The sun and the moon, the sun is Egypt, the solar calendar, the sun god. Mesopotamia, there's a moon god, seen. The, the calendar is, sol, is lunar. Egypt and Mesopotamia bowed down to Yosef. And that's the Abdu Hamim Mishabulumim was Yosef. That's also Yosef. But that's the dream. But what's the Kiddush of the dream? Kiddush of the dream that there's 11 stars, which means what? If there's 11 stars, let me take the share off. If there's 11 stars in the dream, all back, that means we're all chosen. It's not six stars or two stars or three stars you follow. You're part of the same nation. You're the Bechor, not the Bechir. God's telling Yosef, you're not the only one. You're the leader of the family. But how big is your family? 11. What's that mean? There's two matriarchs and two shvachot. There's actually four matriarchs. You follow? All the tribes, even the half-bloods are chosen. No one can even fathom that growing up because it's either us or them. How many Ashkafa can there be? And God's telling him there's room and there's a need for 12 tribes from different mothers, even from half-bloods. Even though you're chosen, you don't have to be pure stuff. You, don't, you can be, forget what the Harry Potter analogies. But I think, and there's room for 12 tribes. Each one has their own flag. Each one has their own understanding of what needs to be. Like there's a need for the, if you're going to be a model for other nations to work together, you have to be 12 tribes with, with different outlooks, but who can work together. You can have a common goal, even though you have different outlooks on life. And that's already my hashkafa. I'm reading into the story probably. But I think what God was trying to tell them in Yosef's dream, remember Yosef tells the dream to his brothers, no one gets the dream. God was screaming to them, grow up. Quit fighting. There's nothing to fight about. You can all be chosen. And they just don't get it. God had to send a, uh, God had to send a, a, a pandemic, not pandemic, but to get them to wake up and realize there's too much sinat chinam, even though they're sure there's always reasons for it. I hope you got the message. Um, that was my point for the, uh, for the end of this year. So I tried to show you, with, with that understanding of the Bechira process, the idea of Bechora and Bechira, and the Bechora's responsibility, not privilege, and there's a goal involved in being God's people, but I'm trying, trying to find a logic. Everything Yaakov does makes sense, even though he might have made the wrong decisions at times, and he pays a happy price for them, but he really meant well. And sometimes in life, you really mean well, and you have a goal, but things just don't work out right. But that's not a reason to, to take oil and maybe light candles on Hanukkah and remember that even when times are down, there's always a better future sometime in the future. So... Um, that's why Yaakov is always going to be the symbol of Amisro and Galut or in exile when things are far from perfect, but not giving up on your long-term goals, even though life is pretty lousy. So we'll stop here. Uh, I'll take questions, but I know I went over time a little bit. Yeah, question, Harold. Okay, so just uh, maybe a different uh, perspective on Yaakov's inability to build the, the house of God. Um, based on uh, the pasuk that uh, you, uh, that we uh, mentioned at the beginning, when Moshe Rabbeinu was told by God to tell Pharaoh that Bani Bechori, uh, that, that, my, that Israel yeah. is my firstborn. And Rashi says that this moment in time is now the kiyum of the, Bechor, of the Mechirat Bechora from Esau to Yaakov. Meaning that even though Yaakov took made a neder, he was not obligated to actually finish or be that work itself because that's not how Jewish history works. So Yaakov did what he needed to do to build some kind of a foundation that ultimately would lead to a kiyum of, of that particular uh, uh, that particular event or that particular neder. And that and the kiyum occurred generations and years and or uh, hundreds of years later. 
So, in I'll, fact, I'll, I'll, I'll add something to that, Harold. Huh? When is Rashi living? In Under the, Christian rule, right? Right for around Crusader time? Little, yeah. little, right there. Who's Edom? Who's Esav in, in Jewish thought, in medieval thought? Right. Edom Christianity. is yeah. Christianity, right? Okay. Correct. What position are they in? They're running the show, aren't they? They're the Bukhar. Got it? And the argument is, who's Bukhar? Who's God's firstborn? Is it the Christians or is it the Jews? Don't you have Rashi? Rashi's commentary is right on the mark for his time period. Um, I, I can argue the story, the, the, whether it's Pratt and the Pasuk or not, but that's a, such a great example of Rashi understanding his time period and what he's reading into Edom. Because I'm sure the Edom is not, is not Rome. But thematically, Edom is Rome. Now, once Edom becomes Rome, then you understand that the ancient Rome, Egypt is ancient Rome. That they get everything, we have nothing. And just like Amisro was in Egypt, that's, that's Amisro compared to the Christians in Rashi's time. A small nothing people being oppressed and everything. But despite all that, you think you're the Bukhar? We're the Bukhar. And that, that Rashi is awesome, isn't it? When you understand the history behind it. I'm, I'm not sure whether Rashi is, is really, is that's really proud of the Psukim there, but the insight is awesome. Yeah, it's right in the mark. I, I wasn't, I forgot, and I forgot that Rashi, but that Rashi is great. And um, already? Well, I think it also explains Jewish history that the fact is, and and that one's legacy, even if one does not see the fruits of of of, of your labor in your lifetime, that doesn't mean that you're that you still have a legacy. It doesn't mean you've been unsuccessful in yeah. accomplishing what God had intended for you to accomplish. Yeah, I think what you're saying is exactly that, Benazir, isn't it? Hashem ki zaram. It's not, it's not Yaakov and Esav, it's the future of the Jewish people. It might take thousands of years till it happens. But I think that's what Ebenezer is alluding to, which is also the same time period, isn't it? Ebenezer? Well, yeah, <laughs> they all are. <laughs> okay, very good. Thanks for pointing that out. That was awesome. All right, yes, Kaya. Okay, everyone have a wonderful day. It's good seeing you guys again. And by Esav used to be Shabbat Bethel. Oh, oh, come visit Bethel. Okay, that's right. That, 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 but that's dangerous because it's Beitel Yushalayim or Beitel near Ramallah. You follow? It's Beitel Yushalayim or it's Beitel um, where the Yishu Beitel is now today. That's a big machloka between archaeologists, you know, Pashtunim, etc. But, but we can, we can machmir and hold by both. The Beitel is Beitel and Beitel is Yushalayim. To you know, to the Beit Hamikdash. Okay. Anyway, thanks for, by the way, that argument, who's the Bukhar between Rachel and Leah, that goes on to alter by Rishon, doesn't it? Is the Beit Dimidash in Yehuda or in Beitel? Is the kingdom from Yehuda or, or Ephraim? We don't get over that Bukhar for a long time. We're trying to continue it also. <laughs> okay, anyway, thanks so much and have a good have a good week, everybody, and everyone stay healthy. Do well. Okay. Shabbat Shalom. כל טוב, תודה רבה. תודה רבה. אוקיי, ביי ביי. טוב, תודה רבה. תודה רבה, אנחנו מס...